Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We are watching in real time what is happening in Ukraine. This utterly monstrous human display disaster play out in every direction. United Nations estimates that as midnight on Tuesday, there have been over 500 civilians killed in Ukraine, 900 injured. Now, that number is surely higher today as we continue to see the Russian military shelling residential areas near Kiev as civilians flee for their lives. Or a children's hospital in the city of Mariupol that was totally destroyed by a Russian attack. Today, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas Greenfield said, quote, We're working with others in the international community to document the crimes Russia is committing against the Ukrainian people. They constitute war crimes. There are attacks on civilians that cannot be justified by any in any way whatsoever. Now, we are just over two weeks into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and while the devastation is truly horrifying, the Ukrainian military has put up a fight against a Russian military convoy making its way to the capital city of Kyiv. Tonight, we're learning that a senior U.S. defense official says Russian forces have made some advances in the last 24 hours and could be as close as 10 miles from the center of Kyiv. And so as we continue to monitor that situation and we hear uh, calls for escalation in various directions, I think it's important to step back and note there has not been a land invasion on this scale on continental Europe since World War II. And there has not been an economic response like what we have seen from the U.S., NATO allies, the EU, and the West either. The U.S. and its allies have taken truly, I mean truly, unprecedented steps to sanction and pressure Russia to withdraw its forces. The U.S. has stopped buying Russian oil and gas. They've banned transactions with Russia's central bank, which is probably the single biggest move. The Ministry of Finance, the National Wealth Fund, they've cut off Russia's bank's access to the SWIFT international payment system. They've announced travel bans and asset freezes on Russian oligarchs individually. They personally sanctioned Russian President Vladimir Putin. And adjacent to that are a bunch of private businesses making similar decisions. International companies like Apple and Visa and ExxonMobil have stopped doing business there. There has been, again, nothing like this response that we've ever seen. And yet, to Ukrainians living through the invasion of a much more powerful adversary, it is clearly not enough. Their civilians have fled by millions as their country is being pulverized all around and behind them. And despite their incredible resistance to this point, there is a sense, and they will say it themselves, that they feel overmatched. And that is pr precisely why Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has repeatedly asked for the U.S. and NATO to do more, to close the skies, is one phrase he's used, to enact a no-fly zone to provide his military with more fighter jets. We are speaking about closing the sky. You can't decide to close or not to close. You can't decide. If you are united against the Nazism and this terror, you have to close. Not me. Don't wait me asking you several times, a lot, million times, close the sky. No, you have to phone us to our people who lost their children and say, sorry, we didn't do it yesterday. Now, there's every reason in the world for Zelensky to be calling for that. I mean, they're literally under a bombardment. But again, I just think it's important to reestablish the context for why those things are not happening. Because in the year 2022, the Cold War doctrine of mutually assured destruction seems like some sort of antique relic. Unfortunately, We've got to pull it out of the closet and dust it back off and remember what it is. The Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union lasted more than 40 years, and it was called the Cold War for a reason, because it was distinguished from the hot wars, the shooting wars that had happened on the continent in World War I and World War II, and that were also happening all across the world between various proxies of the two sides. And during this massively destructive period that we know as the Cold War, we came very close to nuclear war several times, most notably during the Korean War and during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we all know about the duck and cover drills in classrooms and the backyard bomb shelters that got built. And what got built up over this time was this architecture of mutually assured destruction. The idea is that if either the U.S. or the Soviet Union fired nuclear weapons at the other side, both sides would then fire their full nuclear arsenals and obliterate all of humanity. So each side had to avoid engaging in a direct military shooting confrontation, a hot war with the other, to avoid nuclear Armageddon. And so nearly all the countries of Europe were basically under the protection of one of these two kind of nuclear umbrellas, the U.S., which was NATO, 
or the Soviet Union, which was the Warsaw Pact. And meanwhile, outside of Europe, outside of the continent where those two world wars had happened, there were these massively brutal, destructive proxy wars playing out all across the world in places like Angola and Nicaragua and Afghanistan and Vietnam, with the two sides arming their proxies and funding different armies and coups and death squads and revolutions and counter-revolutions and generally causing enormous amounts of dislocation and human misery. But during the Cold War, the two sides did avoid nuclear arm again, which is why I'm speaking to you here today. I know this is a weird history to go through, but again, it all existed for a reason, and it may seem remote now, but nothing about the fundamental dynamics of mutually assured destruction has changed. As the U.S. and its allies once again attempt this delicate maneuver of supporting Ukraine without triggering a shooting war between the U.S. and Russia. And that is why the U.S. has consistently said no to enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Now, NATO has established them before, including in Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1994, when U.S. fighters shot down four Serbian jets. That was the first NATO military action since its founding. So if that were to happen over Ukraine, the U.S. would be shooting down Russian jets. That's exactly what the U.S. did its best to avoid through the entirety of the Cold War. General Mark Milley, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just got back from a five-day tour of NATO front nine nations. And while he was there, he addressed what a no-fly zone could mean. I'm, uh, if a no-fly zone was declared, someone would have to enforce it. And that would mean someone would have to go, then go and fight against Russian air forces. Again, what he's saying there is that would mean U.S. combat against Russian military directly, a hot war. There's a real danger about this happening because of what we went through during the Cold War. Now, there's a lot the American government can do to help Ukrainians. In fact, if you look at the polling, Americans recognize that we are witnessing, indeed, a grave crime in Ukraine, and they want to do more to stop it. A new Quinnipiac poll this week found 56% of Americans say the steps the Biden administration have taken are not tough enough. 71% agree they support a ban on Russian oil, even if it means higher gasoline prices in the United States. There is a strong bipartisan will to do more. None of that waves away the grim logic of mutually assured destruction, the reality of the nuclear age, and the existential risks that come with the shooting war with a nuclear power.